In the fall of 2017, the air was filled with the excitement of college life at Trinity University. But not everything was what it seemed for one student. Partying, drugs, and unhealthy relationship would lead to a tragic ending for 19-year-old Kaylee Mandati. Her dreams and aspirations brutally cut short, but was it an accident or murder? I'm Erica Hernandez. And I'm Lee Waldman. This is Texas Crime Stories, Twisted Love, the Kaylee Mandati Tragedy. Kaylee Mandati seemed to have it all. College cheerleader, sorority member, smart and popular. But in September 2017, things changed for Kaylee. She broke up with her boyfriend, Jet Burcham. The two had been together for about nine months when they broke up, and she immediately started dating Mark Howerton. Mark was not a student at Trinity University, but had a friend that went to the school and often hung out with the same crowd as Kaylee. As the two started to date, her friends weren't too fond of Mark and noticed some unusual behavior. Kaylee started telling her closest friends that she wasn't happy with Mark and wanted to break up with him, but was afraid to. Things started to escalate. In one instance, when Kaylee went to a party that Mark didn't want her to go to, he trashed her dorm room and threw her clothes out the window. When Trinity University police got a noise complaint, Mark was found inside alone and said he was waiting for Kaylee to return. Because he wasn't a student and police noticed the damage to the room, he was told to leave. Charges were later filed and he wasn't allowed on campus. Kaylee continued to see Mark and tried to break it off, but he would tell her he was going to commit suicide if she left him. As things progressed, they didn't get any better, and Kaylee was reaching out to her ex, telling him she was scared. In text messages, she would tell him she was afraid of Mark and wanted to get back together with him. She told him she was finally going to end it. On October 29th, 2017, Kaylee went with Mark to the Malaluna Music Festival at Nelson Wolf Stadium. The two weren't there long after Kaylee and Mark spotted Jet there as well. The two instantly left. They left around 3.45 p.m. Kaylee wasn't seen again until around 10.30 p.m. when Howerton showed up to a Luling hospital. Kaylee was unconscious, nude from the waist down, and covered in bruises. CPR was started right away, but it was too late. Kaylee was brain dead, and on October 31st, she was taken off life support and passed away. What happened to Kaylee? What did Mark do to her? Did he beat her to death, or was it all an accident? Mark was immediately questioned at the hospital by police. The story he told, though, wasn't adding up. He told police they left the festival and were going to drive back to Houston because she no longer wanted to go to school and wanted to get away from her friends and family. He said they argued about seeing her ex, Jet, but eventually pulled over off Interstate 10 at a Valero to have what Mark says was rough makeup sex. Mark also said the two had been drinking and had taken a large amount of the drug Molly. After having sex, he said he got back on the highway, but noticed Kaylee had passed out and then stopped breathing. He said he panicked and sought an exit to a hospital where he took her. Police questioned him and asked what Valero he was referring to because they didn't know of one in the area off I-10. The Texas Rangers would soon get involved and help with the investigation. Kaylee's autopsy report later ruled she had died of blunt force trauma to the head and her death was a homicide. Months after her death, a warrant was out for Mark's arrest. He was charged with murder and aggravated sexual assault. Mark was now heading for trial, but it wasn't what many expected. In December 2019, Mark stood in a Bear County courtroom, and what was revealed shocked many. Prosecutors showed evidence of a possessive and controlling Mark who would easily lose his temper and try to manipulate Kaylee. Meanwhile, the defense painted a different picture, saying the bruising on Kaylee could have been caused by medical personnel as CPR was administered, and that the molly she was on could have contributed to her death as well. And when Jet took the stand... He got caught up in lies, and what he said on the stand was not the same as previous statements he made. He testified that he saw Mark force Kaylee to leave the festival by grabbing her forcefully by the arm, but he later said that he actually didn't see that and that he just saw them walk away. His testimony damaging to the state. In the end, during deliberations, the jury was deadlocked 8-4, to and the trial would end in a mistrial. Mark, for now, was again able to avoid prison, and Kaylee's family were left still seeking justice. 
news, weather, mental health, true crime, and all things San Antonio. KSAT has a podcast for everyone with a local twist. Tune in daily for the day's top stories on KSAT News Now. Or learn more about South Texas weather phenomena with whatever the weather. Deep dive into mystery with true Texas crime stories that happen right here in our own backyard. And count on the KSAT Explains team to answer some big questions about San Antonio. Plus, our newest edition, Living Out Loud, making mental health easier to tackle in San Antonio. Find us anywhere that you get your podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Or watch the video versions on our KSAT YouTube page. Remember to subscribe there too. All right, so Lee, there's a lot to unpack with this case. It is from 2017, and we just got done with it in June of 2023 because that's when the retrial finally took place. There were so many red flags for me in hearing this story over and over again. Yeah, I'm interested to hear what the timeline was for this trial. Yeah, so it took so long because first we had it in 2019, the first trial ended in mistrial, and then COVID hit. So we had to wait. But then his attorneys filed a appeal saying that they shouldn't go to trial again because it was almost like double jeopardy. But it got denied. That whole process, though, takes about a year in and in itself. So we finally didn't get that retrial till, like I said, just this past June. And it was a lot of it was really interesting to hear. I didn't sit through that first trial, so I was seeing a lot of this for the first time. And it was a very twisted relationship I think that's fairly obvious from what her friends had said in his behavior in her dorm room when she just went to a party like a college student should be able to do yeah and a lot of it was like you said so many red flags they had only been dating for like three or four weeks when all of this started kind of escalating that's not a a long time in relationships you know to see that type of behavior concerning Very, very concerning. Of course, her friends were concerned about what they had seen. And if she's reaching out to an ex-boyfriend to say, I'm scared of my new boyfriend, that's another red flag. Yeah, but every time, and we saw it, and a lot of the key evidence was cell phone data, text messages. She was in those text messages. She would, you know, say, you know, or between even her and Mark, she would be like, I can't do this anymore. And he's like, you're not going to leave me. You can't leave me. I'm going to, you know, I have my gun here. I'm going to shoot myself. I'm going to end it all. He would text her those messages back. And she's like, no, don't do that. You know, you can't do that. And eventually she'd go back. It's that cycle we kind of see with domestic violence. And just kind of a PSA, if you are in a relationship like this one, there's so many different resources. We'll link them in this story that you can reach out to for help. So if you're in a relationship, this sounds like a lot like what you're going through. There's resources out there. We'll link them. You don't have to stay in something like that. Yeah, it's obviously they both needed to seek some type of help. He obviously wasn't in his own right mind, and he had these anger issues. He had these manipulation issues. She kept falling for it. She didn't know how to get out of it, and she kept going back. Um, I want to go back and talk about that cell phone data, and I wanted to make it very clear because there is a large gap of time from the time she was last seen at the festival until they showed up at the hospital. So I wanted to go over a little bit of the timeline because they revealed it through the cell phone data of where they were kind of at. So remember, he said they just instantly went to Houston and pulled over on I-10 And that's not exactly what the cell phone data revealed. So at 2.37 p.m., his phone is at Trinity University. So this is essentially him picking her up for the day. And then at 3.42, his phone was near the area of the Nelson Wolf Stadium where the festival was taking place. 4.05, his phone was in the area off of Highway 281 by the corporate Whataburger offices across from the quarry. 4.23 4.23 p.m., Mandati's phone started showing up in the same area off of Highway 281. At 5.33, her phone is still showing up at the corporate Whataburger offices. So that's a, already about, what, almost two hours or an hour and a half that they were there in that area. And then at 7.14 p.m., her phone is now in the area off Loop 410 near the San Antonio International Airport. So that's not a big di- distance. If you know the area of San Antonio Where the quarry is, that area where the Bodeberger offices are to the airport is about like 
less than a five minute drive. They were there at those offices in that area for quite a time. But then from 533 to 714, it's moved again, but not very far. 727, about 10 minutes later, Howerton's phone is now in the same area near the airport. And then her phone is almost like turned off. We don't get any more pings from her phone. Howerton's phone at 10.39 p.m. is now in the area of Interstate 10 near Luling. So what is going on is the big question. He's saying they were just going straight to Houston, and then he goes see Luling, but now this data is showing they were at the Whataburger office's parking area, then they were by the airport, and then hours later, now they're close to Luling. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. And also, what what really isn't clicking for me, and maybe they talked about it in the trial, so maybe you'd know more, why are their phones showing up at different times in different places? Is there, are they in the same vehicle? Are they in different vehicles? They're in vehicle? the same vehicle. I think they were pinging off of different towers, but they wanted to show that they were in the same area, same area, same area. Her phone drops off at some point because he turns it off. And what I, I didn't put here in our notes, but her friends were calling. Her friends were like, you missed a meeting today, a mandatory sorority meeting. You don't usually miss these. What's going on? Are you okay? She never answered the phone. But at one point, he sends a Snapchat from her phone telling them, and excuse my language, he's like, stop calling you bitches. She's fine. She's okay. She's right here, but never shows her. And then her phone goes turn, gets turned off, obviously by him. None of that is adding up to what his story is making it seem to be. If she really wanted to go to Houston, she would have told her friends, hey, I'm going through a lot right now. I'm going to Houston. Bye. Yeah. But you would think someone who's that connected to her friends at all times is going to say something like, hey, I'm leaving. Yeah, there was just, it was just really absurd behavior. And there was, and he just kept saying, no, you know, we, we were driving and, you know, we did stop and have, you know, the makeup sex, but she passed out and I freaked out. And then I know she wasn't breathing. And I started, you know, trying to give her CPR with one hand as I'm driving. And then I saw the exit to the hospital. So I immediately went there. You know, he was almost, I felt like he was putting on the front that he was concerned. My theory, what happened is, and I think it was the prosecution's theory, something happened during that makeup sex, because they obviously did have it, and he, she hit her head, he pushed her head, whatever, because she was covered in bruises. They showed photos. She has bruises on her arms, all down her legs, on her face, on her side of her ear, and they kept saying the defense, oh, that could have been caused from CPR, that could have been caused from all the, you know, the tubes and stuff being put in her, the molly induces bruising that she had taken that day. So it was really, they were theories. Everybody had a theory. It's sad that the only two people that really know what went on, one can't speak for herself anymore. Do they know, I mean, do they know if it was consensual sex that happened? There is no way of telling because she passed out and would never wake up again. And they were technically in a relationship still at the time. So there was, it's kind of his word, you know, it, it's really hard to tell. Um, the way she was found, though, was, was very um, shocking. You know, there was, one of her boots was off on the floor. She was naked from the waist down and just kind of passed out in the passenger seat of a car. But he was saying a lot of things in some of his, you know, statements to police that was hard to believe because he would say, he said they had moved to the back seat of the car. But he had a giant box in the back seat of his car. There was no way that would, you know, realistically that could have been possible. So, but she was, you know, her, her death was ruled blunt force trauma to the head. It was a homicide. Yeah, that, none of that really makes a lot of sense. And, and they did bring a separate ME in to kind of evaluate uh, Dr. Kimberly Molina, our medical examiner here in Bear County, who has extensive knowledge. She's our chief uh, medical examiner here. And she reviewed that autopsy report. And she's like, I would have came up with the same, the same conclusions. I'm not surprised that it's blunt force trauma to her head, knowing what condition she was found in. Just his story doesn't make any sense of how that would have happened. 
Yeah, and like I said, it's it's I'm sure heartbreaking for her family. They will never truly know what happened inside that vehicle. Yeah, let's talk about what the jury deliberations were after getting all of this because perfectly honest, I wouldn't want to be a jury on this case because I don't have a clear picture of what's happening here. And I think that's why we saw the result we did during the deliberation. So this time around, they could consider the lesser charge of aggravated assault causing serious bodily injury. So this would make it a second degree felony. It's like a step down from murder. The prosecution asked for this to be added to the, the, the jury charge, not the defense. They wanted it just to stay with murder. They didn't want another option on there. Because they didn't want the jury to say, oh, he's not guilty of this, so he can get guilty of something else. They wanted him to say, oh, not guilty. We couldn't say without a reasonable doubt he murdered her, so then he would just be let off. Exactly. So in the end, they would find him not guilty of murder, but guilty of that aggravated assault charge, which is a second-degree felony. He was later sentenced by 144th District Court Judge Michael Mary to the maximum per that charge, which is 20 years in prison, which obviously he's eligible for parole in half. The prosecutor, David Lunen, who has been on this case from the beginning, um, said Mandati's family was relieved to finally have some kind of closure in this case. Obviously, it's not the amount they wanted, but at least he would be serving time for, for some of this. And this is a little bit what Lunen had to say to us after the trial. We're happy the family's satisfied that there's closure here in having to uh, meet with uh, family members and, and friends and, and everything else who, uh, who, are, who are grievously affected by these crimes. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and they've been hurting and, uh, we're happy to conclude it today. So Howerton, he's now serving his time at the Garza West unit in Beeville. And like you said, he's eligible for parole in, in half that time. So his eligibility date, May, 2033, he's currently 28. So he could be 38 in 2033. So, so he still has a life plenty to live. of life to live, plenty of relationships. He could possibly get in. Um, ladies, Google who you're dating. Hopefully he learned something from this and he is not the same person. Obviously you don't want to see another person hurt by him again. Um, it was, there was a sense of, um, so he was out on bond this entire time. So he was free to walk in and out of the courtroom. There was a sense almost of arrogancy about him as he walked in and out, like almost that he thought he would end up scot-free and that they could, didn't have enough. He obviously has a good attorney. His defense attorney, John Hunter, before, who also was the defense attorney for Andre McDonald earlier this year, so which we also saw ended in a not guilty on murder and guilty on manslaughter. Hunter obviously knows what he has to say to get the a jury. All it takes is one juror to be like, mm, maybe this is not murder. And it's worked. It's worked this far, and it's worked to uh, Howerton's advantage in this trial and other trials that we've seen him on as well. Yeah, but I don't want this to solely just, you know, obviously Mark Howerton was a part of the story, but the story is about Kaylee. She is the one who is no longer here with us, and her mom, Allison Steele, has worked really hard on her legacy. Yeah, she created Kaylee's Calling. It's an organization that, uh, through legislation, has passed in creating the Clear Alert. So we hear Amber Alerts. This is kind of similar, but just to give you some backstory, like I said, the night Kaylee died, several of her friends went in person to police and begged for assistance in locating her. However, without an adult alert mechanism to enable a rapid response, law enforcement agencies were limited in what they can do that night. So on May 25th, 2019, Governor Abbott signed House Bill 1769. Again, according to Kaylee's Calling website, Texas has now become the first large population state in America to enact an adult kidnapping interdiction mechanism as strong as what the clear alert represents and to provide a rescue mechanism for adults whose lives are endangered in other situations as well. Now, the acronym CLEAR stands for Coordinated Law Enforcement Adult Rescue. Informally, the letters reflect the first letter of names of victims of violence, such as this. So it's Kaylee Mendati, Delisa Kelly, Aaron Castro, Ashanti Billy, and the rest, which is the other unnamed adults whose lives have been saved if the CLEAR alert had existed at the time of their deaths. I mean, it's great that her death 
is helping other people who could be in this kind of situation because we know domestic violence doesn't just affect women even though it's drastically does affect more women there are men who face domestic violence situations as well so it's it's great that her family has tried to do something with her death and the way that they lost her to help other people and we've seen that so many times you mentioned the amber alert we've done an episode on the amber alert and and how that stands for for amber and how she was taken and And so it's amazing when these things happen, but it's also tragic in the way that they happen. Yeah, like that, that we had what had to lead for it to happen. So I hope, like you said earlier, if you're having trouble, if you're in a relationship, domestic violence and something, even that you're seeing and witnessing as a friend, there are resources, there are places for you to go. Do not end up in a situation where you may not be around for your family and your friends again. Yeah, absolutely. And it's okay to feel scared and not know what to do. There's so many different resources that are there, though. You're not alone in anything. Even if you feel like you're alone, you're not. Thanks for joining us for this episode. We will be back soon with a new one. Don't forget to watch and listen to past episodes on KSAT.com, KSAT's YouTube channel, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get your audio.